There has been a seizure in, in, in Salzburg, Austria, that found them in, in pizza ovens and tumble and dryer machines. So uh, we're starting to see a, a massive expansion of, of Captagon production and smuggling efforts. And a lot of these shipments are sent in one swoop. Um, so millions at a time out of Syria or out of Lebanon into destination markets or transit countries, uh, which also proves that the producers are taking on more risks. They're acknowledging that, uh, you know, with larger Captagon shipments, there is an increased risk of them being intercepted by law enforcement systems. But their production capabilities, production has become so cheap and Captagon has become so profitable for them that they're willing to take on these risks. And I think that that is, is definitely of note as we study how Captagon production has evolved over the time. I'm Scott R. Anderson, and this is the Lawfare Podcast for December 14th, 2021. Syria's decade-long civil war has left the state and economy shells of their former selves. But a new industry is stepping in to fill the void. The manufacture and export of illicit drugs, specifically Captagon a type of amphetamine that has a growing global market. To better understand Syria's emerging role in the global captagon trade, I sat down with Caroline Rose of the New Lines Institute, who has been tracking this industry's development for several years and is preparing to release a major report on the topic. We discussed the origins of captagon, how it came to Syria, and how it's being used by the Assad regime, its allies, and their proxies across the region. It's the Lawfare Podcast for December 14th, Caroline Rose on Syria's role in the Captagon trade. So Caroline, people who follow events in the Middle East and particularly in the Levant region around Lebanon and Syria for the last few weeks and months, we've been seeing a hashtag pop up on Twitter, sometimes from you, sometimes from other folks looking at this issue set called Captagon, which is the name of a narcotic. Tell us a little bit what Captagon is in terms of a product and why we're seeing it pop up in association with these countries in this region these last few weeks and months. So Captagon is a substance that was popular in the 1960s. Uh, it was created by a German pharmaceutical company. It was a licit substance that was sold um, on the pharmaceutical markets, primarily in Europe, uh, to address a number of hyperactivity disorders in some cases, weight loss, uh, performance, and sometimes improving focus uh, among a number of patients. And, and doctors would pre prescribe this drug. You know, it is an amphetamine type substance that increases attention, it increases productivity, it decreases appetite, and it allows you to stay up longer. Um, so it has kind of a, a number of different uses. But in the 1980s, the World, the World Health Organization scheduled this substance and it was taken off the majority of, of licit pharmaceutical markets. For a brief time, it moved to the Balkans where there were production hubs, a lot of facilities that were formerly used by the Soviet Union. Then there was a brief period of crackdowns from uh, Bulgarian law enforcement systems, and that pushed the trade into the Middle East primarily in Syria, where there was a very interesting uh, relationship between Syrian pharmaceutical industry and their scientific community and the Bulgarian scientific community's pharmaceutical industry. And so Captagon found its, uh, so to speak, its home in, in the Levant, specifically in Syria, with limited evidence and small scale, scale production in Lebanon, but primarily it was seeded in Syria where it persisted in the early 2000s, kind of on a limited basis. There were a lot of seizures that were found in Turkey, routed through Europe, but certainly it's not on the scale of what you see Captagon seizures today, which is far more industrialized and, and much more in the millions, um, rather than just you know hundreds or, or, or tens of tablets. Captagon has also shifted in its formulaic composition since the 1960s and even the early 2000s. Um, some of its main ingredients, recent lab analyses haven't necessarily even found that it has phenethylene anymore, which was its main ingredient. 
Instead, it has different types of precursor ingredients and chemicals that are sort of mishmashed by producers to create similar effects. But sometimes there are some harmful precursor ingredients such as uh, quinine, caffeine, uh, like an absorbent amount of caffeine. Sometimes there will be paracetamol, sometimes things like copper or lead that that are laced within the pills. Um, So this is like a very interesting evolution of of the pill that has gone from being an illicit substance on a European pharmaceutical market to something that has now really dominated the Levant and Middle East and Mediterranean at large. Before we get back to the production side of this, I want to just get a better sense of the supply side. Where are the big markets for this drug and, and what are the people who are buying it and smuggling it into these markets doing with it? Like, what what is it for? And why have we seen a level of demand that, if not, that's either sustained or it seems like it must have increased more recently to accommodate this kind of bump in production that we're seeing in the region? So the demand side is is very interesting because it's it's primarily in the Middle East where there is a taboo associated with drug use and consumption. So unfortunately, there have not been a lot of studies or research that has been conducted on the consumer side and what the typical consumer profile is. However, there are there is evidence of proven destination in consumer markets, primarily in the Persian Gulf, specifically in Saudi Arabia, where there is a high rates of con- consumption among Saudi Arabian youth, primarily um, their male population that essentially experience unemployment. They use Captagon to get a short-term high. They use it primarily recreationally as, you know, the activities in in Saudi Saudi Arabia are limited. Also, this is a drug that is perceived as a softer drug because it is associated with increased productivity. It's an amphetamine type substance. It's not necessarily like hard drugs like cocaine, meth, um, so a lot of consumers typically prefer Captagon because it's, it, it doesn't have as much of a taboo. Also, um, there is not a lot of evidence of its addictive qualities. There aren't high rates of rehab um, admittances and, and, and issues in terms of healthcare centers. In the Levant, where a lot of consumers deal with more straining economic conditions, especially under sanctions, under recent uh, trade embargoes between Gulf, the Gulf and, and Lebanon. Captagon has been way more of a um, substance that, that citizens have relied on amidst food insecurity because it staves hunger. It's also a substance that has allowed people to stay up at night. So you've got you know, truck drivers, you've got people working at all hours of the night, people who need that productivity. And so Captagon has very much allowed people to really get through the day. And it's a substance that has really allowed people to to, uh, essentially face some of these economic and political and social constraints. So there are different there are different patterns of usage. However, you know, there's not a lot of research about, you know, the the exact numbers, um, the rates of usage, the the ages and, and the different kind of demographic aspects of, of Captagon usage that would be incredibly important in learning more about the trade. A recent New York Times article on this trade, on this emerging industry, kind of highlighted the fact both of those we've seen an increasing number and scale of busts of where you know law enforcement officers have found and uncovered smuggled amounts of Captagon, but also laid it out on a time frame that has pointed out there are a number of the big busts have occurred more recently in Europe, in Italy and Greece, and even in Malaysia. Is there a reason to think that the Captagon trade is growing outside of the more longstanding markets? Or is that really just a sign of increased law enforcement attention, highlighting activity that's that's long been there already? I think it's a bit of both. And I think this is this is where Captagon is no longer just a a regional trade that persists in Syria and Lebanon and affects destination markets in in the Gulf. I think that this indicates that this is a trade that is expanding into a Mediterranean zone challenge. It is one that has now started to use European and even even ports as far as East Asia and in, in places like Malaysia as transit routes and third country destinations. 
or essentially in order to get to destination markets in the Gulf, they're going to first send it to some of these decoy ports that exist in Greece and in, in Italy, in Malaysia, and they'll send them there first and then with the intention of rerouting them to, to Saudi Arabia. That being said, these are not necessarily just transit routes and they're not just one stop. Some of these drugs have been believed to trickle into um, you know, some consumer markets that exist in Northern Africa, in Europe. There has not necessarily been any evidence of East Asia, but Captagon, because it has such a diverse array of usage and it has so many different qualities, it is a substance that can very much morph into different consumer and drug consumption markets. And so there is reason to believe that, uh, you know, there is limited Captagon consumption in Europe, particularly among diaspora communities or communities that have um, less access to other, other popular drugs in that market. However, again, you know, the, because that there have, you know, there have not necessarily been a lot of studies um, conducted by rehabilitation centers, healthcare centers, and, and other organizations that are, you know, working in the drug space. Uh, we don't necessarily have all of the data that we would need to appropriately quantify Captagon consumption in, in some of these destination and transit markets. But, you know, I think it's worth noting that as Captagon shipments grow and as these shipments become more industrial sized, the consumer markets are also going to change and evolve. And I think that that has started to, of course, demand a large degree of concern from EU lawmakers, lawmakers in North Africa, and then also, of course, the international community. So you've already mentioned this shift that occurred in the 1990s from the Balkans to Syria as kind of a hub of Captagon production. And of course, that period from late 90s, 2000, and particularly the last 10 years in Syria has been a, a very traumatic one with the Syrian revolution and all that that has entailed uh, in terms of unrest, violence, and conflict. Tell us a little bit how, about how the Captagon production industry has changed and interacted with those social factors in Syria, and in particular, how the Assad regime has changed its interaction with it. Absolutely. So Captagon, of course, while there were these relationships, as I mentioned, with Bulgarian, uh, their pharmaceutical industry and their scientific community, Captagon was really born out of the power vacuum that the civil war in Syria produced. And it was, of course, first, uh, you know, it, it evolved. There was always a degree of state participation and interaction with the trade. But for, you know, in, in 2014, 2015, there was a brief moment where ISIS, there, there was limited evidence of, of production and smuggling among ISIS fighters, non-state actors. There were warlords and regime held or non-regime held areas that, of course, used Captagon as a revenue source to help fund the war against the Assad regime and many of its allies on the ground in Syria and of course, Captagon, as, as many have written about, uh, it was also considered a substance that would aid in combat operations. Uh, it would allow fighters to stay up, kind of like caffeine pills. It would allow them to stave hunger, you know, especially with limited food supply and supply lines. Uh, and it would, as you know, some mentioned, it would, it would encourage more aggressive behavior. Now, I would say, you know, the link between aggression and Captagon usage it is not necessarily uh, a proven one. Um, I think in some cases it's been a bit sensationalized, but certainly Captagon produces euphoric effects and, and you know, that has a different effect upon um, you know, different users. And so uh, Captagon was a very popular substance among uh, both regime and then also uh, rebel, rebel force and, and paramilitary consumption. And so that, you know, that was essentially in the mid 2010s and in the last three to four years, we've started to see a major shift um, from non-state consumption, production and trafficking to state backed production and, and smuggling, especially on the industrial level. Before, when Captagon um, was seized at, at, at ports, at border crossings, 
you would see tablets perhaps in the low thousands, even in the hundreds, and they'd be smuggled in, in very unsophisticated ways. They would be hidden under trucks or inside of tires or, um, you know, somewhere hidden within illicit goods. But now we're starting to see captagon seizures in the millions. Saudi Arabia in, in October alone, they seized a number of, of shipments that were averaged around 2.5 million. And they were hidden in very sophisticated ways. They were hidden sometimes with licit food and, and, and vegetable produce, for example, pomegranates. We've seen them hidden in grape crates. We've seen them even sewn into clothes, hidden under floorboards and nailed into trucks. Uh, there has been a seizure in, in, in Salzburg, Austria, that found them in, in pizza ovens and tumble and dryer machines. So uh, we're starting to see a, a massive expansion of, of Captagon production and smuggling efforts. And a lot of these shipments are sent in one swoop. Um, so millions at a time out of Syria or out of Lebanon into destination markets or transit countries, uh, which also proves that the producers are taking on more risks. They're acknowledging that, uh, you know, with larger Captagon shipments, there is an increased risk of them being intercepted by law enforcement systems. But their production capabilities, production has become so cheap and Captagon has become so profitable for them that they're willing to take on these risks. And I think that that is, is definitely of note as we study how Captagon production has evolved over time. And in terms of the regime's, uh, you know, regime production, of course, there is limited evidence because of the, the challenge of, of course, getting data in, in Syria, especially during the civil war. But, you know, as this recent New York Times report, as a number of different investigations and also ground research has proven that there is verifiable evidence of, of, of the fourth division, which is, uh, you know, part of the Assad regime. It's part of the Syrian armed forces. It's commanded by Bashar al-Assad's brother, Maher, that the 4th Division has played an active role in guarding, facilitating, and running a lot of Captagon production in homes, Latakia, and other regime-held areas. You know, they also play a big role in transporting Captagon shipments to state-owned ports, for example, the port of Latakia or Tartus. And then also, of course, facilitating this with the regime's partners, for example, Iran-aligned militias like the IRGC and the Quds Force, as well as Hezbollah and neighboring Lebanon. And so really what we've seen emerge is, is a network and a syndicate of, of Captagon production and smuggling that has generated an, an alternative source of revenue for both the regime and its proxies on the ground. Now, I know it's really hard to see kind of behind the curtain to see what's happening in Syria, particularly when you're talking about within the regime or within the regime and among the regime and its close allies on the ground. But do we have a sense of, of what is driving this shift towards more industrialized, large scale production on the financial side? Is this a case of elites using their elite position for personal enrichment or is this a matter of state policy? seeking an additional source of revenue for, you know, what it views as public policies, even though, you know, I think many people might take issue with the degree to which those policies advance the public interest. That's a great question. And I think it's a matter of both incentives and conditions. So I'll speak a bit about the conditions first. There are a few conditions that allow the regime to make Captagon production more large scale and also more cheap. First, of course, is the fact that they were able to consolidate territory that had the, the former Syrian pharmaceutical industry and their facilities there. A lot of it, of course, is con concentrated around Aleppo and that region. And so state access to these facilities that were not damaged or heavily damaged during the war, that allowed them to shift production from more small scale operations that were more maneuverable. They could go you know, undercover from law enforcement and interception to more permanent um, large scale production in, in, in these large uh, warehouses and these large facilities that would allow millions and millions and, and sometimes billions of Captagon pills to be produced. Also, of course, having uh, the access to Latakia, having this link, having uh, you know, the ability more, more control over highway systems, border crossings, also having, I think, a bit more uh, credibility with, with local actors, non-state actors, 
Uh, I think that that has also, of course, helped them transport the, you know, these Captagon shipments to these these state owned ports and, you know, get them out into the Mediterranean um, or into the Red Sea. And so I think that those are some of the conditions that have allowed them to produce Captagon at a cheaper rate, at a more large scale rate. And then, of course, another driving incentive and a condition that has also driven Captagon production has, of course, been the economic crisis in Syria and the maximum pressure campaign that the United States and its allies has imposed in Syria under the Caesar Act, uh, of course, introducing sanctions against a number of Syrian officials. I think that that has incentivized the Syrian regime and a lot of its members to identify alternative sources of revenue, revenue that doesn't necessarily go back into the Syrian economy directly, but into the pockets of regime businessmen, affiliates, uh, close allies, and of course, family members. Whether this is a direct governmental policy, I cannot necessarily speak to this, just given the limited amount of evidence However, there certainly is no denying that there is a substantial level of state participation in both smuggling and production of Captagon. And despite the occasional seizure within Syria, sometimes their internal security forces and customs systems will, you know, they'll under, undertake a, a seizure of Captagon as kind of a performative way to demonstrate to the international community that they are also concerned with this trade to try and shift blame from the regime to other actors. But often these seizures are conducted with shipments that are undertaken by non-state actors, by adversaries in Syria, not necessarily shipments facilitated and performed by regime allies. So I think that that is definitely of note. We're we're really starting to see large-scale governmental participation in in the Captagon trade. But how direct this is, how high up it goes, uh, certainly I think that there are, um, there's there's substantial evidence with Maher al-Assad. Other elements of the government, I think that there is a lot of research to be done uh, about how far, how deep this goes into the Syrian government. So you've already mentioned that this trade is bleeding over into Lebanon, which isn't surprising given the close ties and complex political relationships between Syria and Lebanon, their neighbors, you know, Hezbollah, is, which is a powerful faction in Lebanon, has a close relationship with Syria and the Assad regime and has for a long time. We know there's already kind of connections between the two in regards to arms trade and lots of other exchanges of personnel and resources and support. But Lebanon is a country that's been facing its own incredibly destabilizing period really over the past several years, but particularly since the 2020 port explosion has kind of given a, a major blow to the national economy, confidence in the government, concerns about corruption remain rampant. So how has the Captagon trade interfaced with those challenges that Lebanon is is facing? How has it impacted the trajectory of Lebanon in terms of a potential recovery? Well, certainly the financial collapse in, in Lebanon has also, of course, been, um, you know, it, it's created heavy impact in Syria. And, you know, just because, uh, you know, both economies are so intimately intertwined, I think that that has certainly uh, played a role in increasing Captagon production and its use as an alternative revenue stream. Now, how Lebanon has been impacted by the Captagon trade itself, certainly there is limited limited evidence of Hezbollah participation in smuggling routes and providing technical expertise to Captagon smugglers and traffickers in terms of identifying routes, helping Captagon get over uh, land borders, you know, essentially facilitating a lot of these shipments. Uh, There has also been limited limited evidence of small-scale Captagon production in the Bekaa Valley and then also areas along the Syrian and Lebanese border, though especially in areas that are controlled by Hezbollah and its affiliates. And then, of course, members of the Lebanese government or popular, essentially, warlords in Lebanon that are, are, are close with the Assad family. So that has certainly played a role. There have been increased Captagon seizures in Lebanon in uh, areas that are not controlled by Hezbollah. And Lebanon, because of this, because it has been a very popular transit route 
they have faced uh, a lot of backlash and blame in the Captagon trade from Persian Gulf states, particularly Saudi Arabia and, and, and its GCDC allies. In the spring, there was a ban on on agricultural produce uh, that was routed from Lebanon into the Gulf after a very, very large uh, Captagon shipment that was found uh, hidden within pomegranate skins. And that ban was, was actually, it should have been directed at any produce coming from Syria uh, because the pomegranates were sourced from Syria, not from Lebanon. Um, this was a shipment that was routed through Lebanon and it was sent out of the Beirut port, but it was originally, it was sourced from Syria, both Captagon tablets and the produce that was used to, to shroud this illicit shipment. I think that Lebanon has caught a lot of the heat uh, from destination markets in regard to the Captagon trade. Uh, recently, too, there was a blanket ban on all Lebanese imports, uh, not necessarily just uh, agricultural products, but all imports into the Gulf, which also coincided with a series of Saudi seizures of, of Captagon shipments that were also you know, in the, in the millions and so I think that uh, Lebanon has been uh, very much affected by, by the Captagon trade. And while their law enforcement system has been struggling to keep up with this, uh, they have to face the fact that Hezbollah plays a very large role, an outsized role, politically and also in its security landscape. And there's only so much their forces can do to stem the trade and to conduct uh, seizures, especially in the Baqa Valley where Hezbollah enjoys a, a, an extreme level of, of influence and control. Lebanon has been put in a very difficult situation um, because of the Captagon trade and because of the Syrian regime's participation in it. One of the unique characteristics that's become a reality in Syria the last few years has been this kind of balkanization of authority, even among the Assad regime controlled parts of the country, and that you see different armed groups working with the Assad regime, supporting them, but also ha operating with a large degree of independence and their own agendas to some extent. Hezbollah is a big example of that, you know, close ties to the Assad regime, but also has its own kind of operations and uh, agenda. But they're not the only one. We also see, uh, you know, groups like Qatab Hezbollah and other Iraqi or at least primarily or originally Iraqi militia groups that are also operating in Syria. Have we seen the Assad regime begin to use those groups in the Captagon trade as well? Is the transnational nature of the conflict and of the support regime for the Assad regime becoming a conduit for the Captagon trade? Or, or have we not quite seen signs of that as of yet? We've seen limited signs and you know, as someone, I, I've been I've been researching this for about three years now, and the one big question I've always had has been, why have we not seen more seizures in Iraq, as well as Jordan and, and Lebanon and some of these transit states to the Gulf? Uh, because there is, like you mentioned, a very well established proxy network that controls a lot of these highways into Syria. And of course, Iraq shares, um, you know, a, a huge border um, that is certainly porous and, and traffickers can make use of in getting to the Persian Gulf. Um, we have started to see some limited, limited evidence. There was a Captagon seizure this year that was intercepted in Kuwait from Iraq. It was an Iraqi truck driver and he had a number of, of Captagon uh, tablets uh, within his truck. It certainly wasn't on the level of what we're seeing at, you know, Saudi Arabian ports, the, the, the seizure was not in the millions, but it certainly is evidence that Captagon is going east as well, um, not necessarily just west and, and, and also south into the Gulf. So I think that that is something to keep note of. And there has been limited evidence of Captagon traveling along the uh, Al Qaim Highway, which is, of course, controlled by uh, Hashid militias under the PMF, the Popular Mobilization Forces and uh, south into destination markets, and then also used for militias themselves. Um, you know, of course, they all cut a profit from, from this by helping transit and helping keep these shipments from being intercepted. So I think it is worth noting that while production is concentrated in Syria, 
Iran and its proxies play an outsized role in helping smuggling and trafficking activities. And they are also seeing a degree of economic advantages from this trade. So in addition to Iran, which is one of the big institutional backers of the Assad regime, the Assad regime also benefits, of course, from Russian support and protection. How have those two governments, the Iranian government, the Russian government, responded to this rise in the Captagon trade? Have they engaged in it proactively? It sounds like Iranian proxies have. I don't know the extent of official Iranian involvement, although you know that's a fuzzy line. But on the Russian side as well, have we seen, and it's worth noting Russia, which sometimes wrestles with its own internal narcotics issues, You know, are they concerned about it? Have they been supportive of it? Have it just been something they have declined to engage in to date? How has it affected the dynamic between the Assad regime and its major institutional backers in the international community? So I think that actually the the Captagon trade has introduced a a very tense element into the relationship between the regime and and the and, and Russia. I think that Russia is not happy with the fact that there is uh, you know a, a very large amounts of, of industrial sized production. But at the same time, they haven't really done much about it. You won't see any seizure activity among Russian forces that are operating in Syria. You know, there haven't been any many statements. There hasn't been any dialogue between Russia and also, um, you know, concerned transit and destination countries. I think that Russia has very much tried to make this an out of sight, out of mind dynamic uh, as they continue to operate in Syria. But certainly this has not necessarily attracted positive reception in both the region and the international community for the regime. And so I think for Russia, it's in their best interest to try and downplay the role that the regime has played in production, shift the blame to Lebanon, shift the blame to non-state actors or actors that are operating in non-regime held areas, and try and, of course, keep a more securitized focus on, on, on Syria rather than its illicit revenue streams. But certainly, I think that as this trade continues to grow, it's going to be harder and harder to deny uh, the regime's involvement in not only smuggling, but also production. But I have not seen any in my research, any evidence of Russian forces or Russian leadership participating or encouraging Captagon production or this illicit economy. I, I have not seen that. Now, you've already mentioned a few times the Gulf states as being a big market driver, you know, demand side for these sorts of things. And the Gulf states, of course, play kind of and want to play, perhaps even more than they do play, a degree of oversized influence in the region because of their wealth, because of their connections to people in Lebanon and other places. And there's this particular moment now where we see a number of the Gulf states trying to reach some degree of rapprochement with the Assad regime, or at least re-engaging in a way that's even ahead of, of most of the rest of the international community. How have they responded to this Captagon trade, which obviously is a domestic problem for them? You know, I've kind of known many of those countries, particularly Saudi Arabia, the UAE, for being pretty aggressive and cracking down on narcotics trade, other sorts of narcotics trades. Is this a priority item for them? Is it something that's being pushed kind of beneath the surface of the water in favor of the broader geostrategic relationship uh, and issues that they're interested in? How does it fit in into the bigger picture of the relations between those countries? It's a great question. And I think that in part, uh, the Captagon trade, because it is a very large domestic priority, but a sensitive one, because it's also a an item of embarrassment for some Gulf states, because it reveals that there is a sizable domestic demand um, and consumer rates for, for Captagon, which, like I mentioned before, you know, in the Middle East, that is very much an item of, of taboo, especially in conservative Gulf countries like Saudi Arabia and the UAE. Uh, so I think that Captagon has become weaponized in many respects and has become a political tool it has been a tool that Gulf states have used for rapprochement with the Syrian regime as they are trying to find spaces for cooperation. And they think some states, and not only just in the Gulf, but also Jordan can be included in this group, they've perceived cooperation and negotiation with, with the Assad regime. They have essentially sought uh, to try and see if they can get the regime to reduce the rate of, of Captagon shipments and reduce the rate of, of, of smuggling activities and operations. 
in turn for recognition or in turn for, you know, incremental uh, relations being resumed. And so I think that this has been a negotiation tactic for Gulf states and some Arab states that are seeking normalization. At the same time, I, I also think that they, they're they trying to be careful and downplay some of the high consumption rates within their country. And um, in the case of Saudi Arabia and some GCC states in this recent export ban, I think that Lebanon and, and Hezbollah, that has now, um, you know, the blame has been shifted to that element rather than the Syrian regime in a way to not disrupt and spoil negotiation and um, uh, reproachment efforts, but then also to, uh, in some cases, fit a political narrative that um, many GCC states have been trying to achieve with Hezbollah and against Iran. So I think that the Captagon trade has been weaponized in many in many respects, especially as these new alliance systems and um, reconfigured uh, security partnerships I think that that has been um, a major development and Captagon has has played a big role in this. So obviously Europe and the United States also play a role in this. Europe, perhaps more directly or imminently, we've already seen major shipments recovered or captured in Europe of these drugs more recently, you know, signs again, that may be becoming an increasing reality there in Europe. That's of course has a variety of of drug concerns already in place. Um, The United States is always kind of taken an interest in the global narcotics trade, perhaps an outsized interest by many people's account. But on top of that is also the major driver of sanctions against Syria, that in a lot of ways, the Captagon trade is being used to bust. What sort of policy responses have we seen from them in the last couple of years as this issue has come to the fore? And what do they appear to be teeing up? I know there's some language about Captagon and narcotics trade in the region in uh, at least one, uh, I can't remember if it's the House or the Senate version of the NDAA that's currently being debated in the U.S. Congress. What sort of steps are people considering moving forward? So for years, the United States had always been aware of the Captagon trade. I think uh, in the last three years, though, have started to acknowledge its importance and potential security threats to not only uh, you know our partners in the Middle East, but also, of course, our European partners And so because of that, I think that we're starting to see, as you mentioned, this language in the NDAA amendment that advocates for an interagency strategy. Because beforehand, our our strategy in Syria and the Middle East at large didn't really take into account the Captagon trade. And then on top of that, it was very much fragmented. So you had, of course, Treasury and the Department of State um, very hyper-focused on the maximum pressure campaign against Assad. Whereas the Department of uh, you know, Drug Enforcement, DEA, uh, I, I think that they were a bit more focused, of course, with the Captagon trade overall, its uh, regional effects and uh, certainly seizures that were, that were happening in the Gulf and in so- Southern Europe. And the DEA has played a very large but quiet role in assisting states, transit and destination markets in getting this intelligence with helping foil um, some of these operations helping with seizure data, and then also, I think, to a degree, facilitating uh, bilateral relations and um, uh, intelligence sharing partnerships between Gulf countries and Southern European countries. For example, Greece and Saudi Arabia, they've collaborated quite a bit over foiling Captagon operations. That being said, I don't think that there has been a comprehensive plan or strategy within the United States government on how to incorporate the DEA's strategy against Captagon into the United States foreign policy plan and strategy in Syria. How do we curb production? How do we try and ensure that sanctions are directed to essentially and designed to ensure that Captagon production does not undercut existing U.S. sanctions? How do we seek to reduce demand and consumption rates in the Middle East? How can we advise our partners there to do that? So I think that these questions are finally being asked. And as you mentioned, you know, this NDAA amendment, I think, is a really great start. It doesn't really you know, propose anything drastic. It really essentially just asks that the United States contemplate a strategy on curbing this illicit trade and, you know, essentially propose steps from there on how to proceed. And so I think that in the next year or two, I think we'll see a much more proactive United States in encouraging its partners to be aware, observe this trade, 
to um, be a bit more active in, in encountering it, you know, upping their law enforcement systems and custom systems um, for increased seizures, also watching consumption rates at home, sharing data, sharing intelligence, and then, of course, keeping the accountability with the Syrian regime very strong and, and certainly sharing um, you know, intelligence about how the regime has increased or changed its production capabilities. So I think we're going to see a very different U.S. policy on Captagon. I think it'll be much less silent, a lot more active, and a lot more comprehensive. So you've obviously spent a lot of time examining the dynamics around Captagon, more so probably than just about anybody else that I'm aware of, at least. You know, what are the big takeaways that governments and policymakers should be focusing on in approaching this question? Like, what are the three big things they need to bear in mind in terms of whether it's aspects of this they have to keep an eye on or things they should consider moving forward that's going to best position them to develop an effective policy in addressing the Capricorn trade? That's a great question. I think first that Capricorn has been very easily sensationalized, and it's very important to keep in mind that this trade is very nuanced. There are so many different layers to production and and, and smuggling that you can't necessarily just shift all of the blame on um, Bashar al-Assad himself. There is an entire machine behind uh, Syrian production. It's not just the state that is engaged in this, although certainly they, they have been behind the majority um, of large-scale uh, captagon seizures, but also there are a number of non-state entities and actors that have participated in the Syrian trade as well. But at the same time, certainly, it's going to be very important that the United States recognize that, you know, there's this is a multifaceted landscape that they're going to need to uh, design a policy to to counter Captagon production, but also demand reduction. This shouldn't necessarily just be a solution where we increase seizures, we increase law enforcement um, presence in, in the Gulf in Southern Europe and other destination markets. We should also think about how do we improve the conditions that drive people to produce Captagon and consume Captagon? And I think that's very much an economic question, um, as it is a political question um, and security question. How do we help these economies where there is high consumption rates? How do we make life better? How do we how do we improve these conditions? How do we offer adequate health care and rehabilitation services for those who are addicted to Captagon or struggling with Captagon uh, consumption? How do we reduce the conditions that drive the regime to produce Captagon in the first place? How do we uh, essentially try and save them from, from uh, turning to Captagon as, as essentially an alternative revenue source? So I think that that's going to be one of the primary concerns that the United States should be very concerned with. I also think that considering Captagon as a Mediterranean level challenge rather than a Syria level challenge is going to be very important. This trade continues to evolve. You know, We're starting to see seizures as far as East Asia. It's not just contained to the Levant anymore. And so a strategy that counters regime production is not going to be a strategy that undercuts the Captagon trade as a whole. So I think that's going to be very important. And then lastly, I think that, uh, you know, keeping in mind that, you know, there there are people on the other side of this, there are people who experience the effects of the Captagon trade every day. You know, there there have been lives lost over this trade. You know, in, in, in Jordan, there have been clashes between smugglers and internal security forces. There are those that experience severe health challenges because of Captagon consumption. This is, this is something that has really transformed the security landscape of the region. And so approaching this as such will be very important, not necessarily just a you know, DEA specific problem, but certainly a, a Middle East policy problem. I think that is going to be very important for the United States to incorporate as it moves ahead with uh, countering the Captagon trade. Now, you do a lot of writing and talking and podcasting about the Capticon trade as somebody who spent a lot of time looking at it. But you have a big product uh, that's the culmination of several years of work coming out in just a couple of weeks. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure. So this has been uh, three years in the, in the works, believe it or not, almost three years in the works. Uh, this is a report that uh, initially uh, essentially 
got me to work on Captagon in the first place. It started at the London School of Economics International Policy Unit, uh, along with my co-author, Alexander Soderholm. It was 2018, and, and Captagon was a trade that was transforming in the Middle East, uh, primarily before it was associated with uh, Daesh consumption and production. And it started out of a question of, is that really true? Uh, is Captagon now consumed and produced and, and trafficked by other actors in Syria? And if so, who? And uh, from there, it evolved into this longer project, because, of course, as we were writing it, Captagon, there was more evidence that the regime was participating in the Captagon trade, that the Captagon trade was growing um, you know, beyond its traditional markets. And so uh, this, this really turned into kind of a mammoth report about the Captagon trade, its origins and where it's headed. And so uh, this will be publishing with the New Lines Institute in January or February of 2022. And uh, yeah, it's been three years of, of research, of interviews with law enforcement officials, with governmental officials, with researchers, with rehabilitation centers in the region that are dealing with this issue. It looks at transit markets, uh, consumer markets essentially how the Captagon trade is evolving into a Mediterranean level security threat. And it also, of course, uh, has an entire section of U.S. and EU policy recommendations on what they can do to counter this trade and to, of course, you know, uphold human security in the region. Well, we will look forward to reading that. But for today, unfortunately, we are out of time Caroline Rose, thank you so much for joining us here today on the Lawfare Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. Please rate and review us on iTunes wherever you may have found us. And be sure to visit lawfareblog.com to read our written work. Or visit thelawfarestore.com where you can pick up some Lawfare-themed stocking stuffers from t-shirts to mugs. You can get ad-free versions of this and other Lawfare podcasts by becoming a material supporter of Lawfare at patreon.com slash lawfare. You'll also get access to special events and other content available only to our supporters. This podcast was edited by Jen Pacha Howell, and our audio engineer this week was Hamza Shatu of Goat Rodeo. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. As always, thank you for listening.